Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on-demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Go Figure. Uh, today we have a very, very special session. We have a very special episode because we've got my two former mentors, two entrepreneurs, two founders, uh, we're all from Indonesia. We all met in Harvard Business School. Yep. And somewhere along the journey, we decided to merge all three of our companies together. And, uh, and now we're all here. Um, so I've got my friend Ryu here. Hey guys. What's up Ryu and Aldi hey guys. over here. Um, just to give some context about where they are now in Gojek and then I'll let them explain a little bit about their background. Um, Aldi right now is the CEO of GoPay uh, and leads our, all of our payments and financial services arms. And Ryu is the head of all things merchants in our organization, dealing with our uh, merchant super app. Uh, people tend to forget that Gojek is not just a consumer super app. We also have a small business, small to medium business super app. Uh, and the platform here is run by Ryu. Uh, what's up, guys? How the hell did we get here? How do we get here? It's been a long journey, guys. <laughs> 2012 was when it all started. Was that when we first met? No, we met in 2000. No, we met in 2000. No, we actually started earlier. We met in 2008. Oh yeah, briefly. Huh. Okay, yes. so I, I met you guys in 2011, right? Okay. Hey, sorry, 2010, no, no, 2010. 2010. So I met you guys in 2010 when I got into uh, school. Yeah, I met him, at, we met in 2008, that first year of school. Like, as there's only two Indonesians in the class. That's right. So I found you yes. being the other Indonesian. Huh? 2009 yeah. or 2008, dude? 2009, man. Oh, 2009, sorry. Yeah, 2009. Yes, yes, 2009. 2009. Wow. Aldi can do math. That's and, <laughs> <laughs> and well, Very important, you know, as the CEO of GoPay. Uh, yeah. Hey, man. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're the self-proclaimed best Excel guy in the I'm, company. I'm yeah, good, man. Yeah. I mean, your tell, private equity background. Why don't you talk a little bit about your backgrounds? Like, tell us the, the elevator pitch of your background. So I'm uh, half Japanese, half Indonesian. My mother is Japanese. I speak fluent Japanese because of that. Uh, I grew up in Indonesia, went to JIS, uh, and then went to school in the U.S., uh, did banking, did private equity for a while. Uh, that's actually, you know, uh, that's my affiliation with uh, Northstar because I went to work for a company called TPG Capital. Oh, okay. And then... And Northstar is uh, our first our first investor. Yeah, your yeah, first investor, One of right. their arms was our first investor. Right. Yeah. So I saw, you know, so I met Patrick uh, Waluyo like back in 2007. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so way back. And then I went to uh, school, uh, B school in the U.S., um, HBS. And then while at HBS, I started my company, Midtrans, and here I am. And just to explain what Midtrans was, mm -hmm. what's what's Midtrans? So Midtrans was an online payments company. Uh, so think of us as like the you know the the BrainTree, uh, Stripe, ADN of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. We helped uh, a bunch of companies, e-commerce companies, accept payments online. Mm -hmm. uh, I think today we are one of the largest players in the market. Um, roughly about 70% of all e-commerce companies in Indonesia work with us one way or another, either as their main gateway or as their backup gateway. And now it's the engine that is fueling the payment gateway that is GoPay, which is allowing all kinds of payment options to come in, right? Not just the right. GoPay wallet, and a bunch of different merchants online and offline all flowing through your engine today. That, that's right. So think of uh, basically what, what we brought to the overall Goji ecosystem was an acquiring system mm. uh, because uh, a merchant is very different from uh, a Gojek user or a Gojek driver. A Gojek driver or a Gojek user is a one individual. A merchant is an entity. And within an entity, there's multiple users. And, and entities can be affiliated with other entities uh, through brand hierarchies or uh, whatnot. So basically, we were trying to bring all that to the GoPay ecosystem, to the Gojek ecosystem. And that, that's exactly what I, what I kind of told you in the beginning. It's like, you know, Ryu, when I was trying to coax you to, to come in uh, and maybe consider joining forces, yeah. I was like, Ryu, we are in our blood a B2C business. We really, you know, we, we know the consumer very well. That's all in our, 
in our blood, but we are very poor at understanding businesses. Right. Uh, we're nowhere near as good as you, and that was part of my my charm to get you to convince. You know. To, yeah, you to, did a lot of different things. Right? Some up. things, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some things didn't. Yeah, some, like, some, something that you know, yeah. yeah. Coercion, you know. Co- coercion. Oh my Pressure. God. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? What is this? Let's not be yeah. too authentic. <laughs> it's like, okay, Aldi, tell us a little bit about your background, man. So uh, Indonesian, grew up uh, just outside of Jakarta. Uh, went to school in Purdue studying computer engineering. Left that, worked for EY for a bit, then really started my career in financial services with Kiva. Like it was like a really small company, six people at the time. Uh, it was peer-to-peer lending. I was uh, helping Kiva find partners in Southeast Asia. Did a bunch of uh, motorcycle rides around Southeast Asia looking for microfinance banks. And then after that, needed money to get married, worked with BCG. and uh, As we all must. Yes. <laughs> Very practical reason. And then at BCG, I did a lot of projects on financial services again. And uh, that's when I started my company, actually, right before business school, uh, Mapan. And it was called Ruma at the time. And we were just helping uh, small community influencers give access to services, like at the time, payments and top-ups to their uh, local neighbors, right? And then uh, basically ran out of money for that company and tried, needed a place to find people who has money and went to business school to hopefully raise money. So that was that was your big motivation there was to in order to raise money and team members for for Mapan. Yeah, because that I think Mapan. at the time, I mean, there was no VC in Indonesia. You guys remember? It was like it was really hard to raise money. I don't know anybody with uh, with a lot of uh, investment capital, and mm-hmm. so I thought that Harvard and Business School was a place where you can get that, and it worked out actually. I you know, I I remember this one moment where I saw you enter the social enterprise competition. Yeah business competition and you actually won it right I won that yeah so that you, was like yeah yeah and and I remembered being green with jealousy at how the other Indonesian of our grade won the social enterprise award and I didn't even have a startup <laughs> so there's <laughs> only I think HVS like there was only two Indonesian your year yeah yeah there's two Indonesian my year that's right that's right so it was me and this other guy called Salomo Yes. Who's our regulator uh, now? Who's our regulator right yes, now? Yes, Central, yeah. Central Bank. Central yeah. Bank, yeah. And then there was uh, Rika Cursanto, uh, who's, uh, you know, he, she has a very, very deep roots in Indonesia, but I think she's she was there also. I think mm. So we had, maybe you could say we had three Indonesians my year. Why, why are we so underrepresented in HBS, given our population? I don't know, man. Uh, you know, how do you, how'd you bullshit your th- way through <laughs> getting into HBS? <laughs> Well, very creatively, <laughs> very creatively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you know, I guess we, there weren't. There was a big gang of Southeast Asians as well when we were there. Uh, but it was not, small, not so dude. Big. It was a pretty it was small, small gang, right? I think, I think when I think about like Southeast Asia and where I struggled when I was applying for business school is the fact that I didn't have really have. I, I was very fortunate. I worked for a private equity firm that went to business school mm. that were able to mentor me to essentially write the right application. You know say the right things during the interviews and i'm not sure if uh, most people have that you know that access you know i mean so. also a lot of it is just financial right i mean like not many people here know that um business school actually has financial aid if you do you know if you do well and that uh, you know you that you can actually afford to go there and the application process a lot of people find daunting right how do you what how'd you, how'd you end up in business school Deem? Uh, for me, my reasons were, were very, very simple. Um, I was getting a little bit tired of consulting, um, and I relished the idea of a two-year vacation, which I could figure out yeah. what to do. Uh, I, I mean, I wish I had a better answer, but that was really... I weird. agree, man. The first things I bought when I went to got in was a, a 42-inch TV and a Sony PlayStation 4. <laughs> 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 and the latest, latest Final Fantasy. But wait... So, yeah. <laughs> But wait a minute. So wait, did you start your company right before HBS or during HBS? During HBS. During HBS. Uh, Aldi, when did you start your company? Right before. And then what, what have you, Dim? So you, you actually to took a big, you took the biggest risk, Aldi, out of all of us. You actually had a company set up yeah. and then left for two years, whereas we at least just came from the professional world and just, just wanted to see what was up. Yeah, I mean, I had to find a, a temporary replacement. You know, remember Booty Man, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it was tough, right? But you know, at the same time, I, I my company was kind of getting stuck because I wasn't able to get capital to grow, right? Mm. And uh, I felt, you know, honestly, struggling balancing between the company that I was founding and BCG was tough, right? And so I thought that you know, business school was a vacation as well. I played soccer constantly, basically the whole time. And, and so, like, 
how do we feel about our experience in business school? Like, how, a lot of people always ask me, like, how pivotal was it in your entrepreneurship journey? Um, and honestly, I think the question, you know, the answer to that is for me always slightly 50 50. Right, there are elements in it that I felt were helpful, and some that I think played no part in my entrepreneurial journey. But I don't know if you if you guys felt differently. Was it transformative for you? And what was what was useful about it for you? I think what was useful was seeing you guys in action, start stuff. I think seeing you guys and a bunch of my other friends like doing pitchathons, doing uh, uh, fundraising uh, for a bunch of different not tech and non tech startups and it, th there was this inherent FOMO um, I think building in me in terms like yo if they can do it so can I right I, I can yeah. do this mm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm another I'm another student I'm just another HBSer here I, I, I believe I can do this so that motivation definitely spurred me forward whether or not the classes or the curriculum actually helped me become a better founder is a question mark I, I, I don't know. I'm still 50-50 on that. I agree. I think, uh, you know, seeing other people on great companies, it makes you think that you could do it also, right? So I yes. think that, that environment and you know, that friends uh, is actually, I think, the, what, what I think was really transformative for me in HPS, yeah. Right. It, yeah. it, it was those side discussions. Yeah, the it side was discussions. The lunches, the dinners, you know, the, the going out and stuff like that. And you really... I mean, initially, though, I have to admit, it was a little bit jarring. It felt like a little bit of a show-off contest. Oh, this is what I did before, and here's what I'm doing here. And a bunch of people were, there were a lot of braggers. I have to, I have to be honest there. Um, it was a measuring contest at some point. It, it was, a little bit. It was a little bit. Uh, but over time, you found the authentic kind of people and the authentic crowds uh, in the business school that were just out there to solve problems. And those were, I found to be the most productive and useful conversations. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Did you have like a watershed moment or like <laughs> a, uh, a particular insp inspiring moment or inspiring friend? No, not really to me. And, you know, uh, I, I think I was, you know, I was very lucky. I had a lot of great friends, but you know, if you want to pinpoint to like one person, one group, I, I, I don't think I had that. Frankly speaking, you know, talking about the value of business school to starting companies, um, you know, had I taken a two-year vacation, had I basically did the, um, you know, met with a, a lot of people over that two-year period, most probably I would have created a company also, mm. right? It would be a different type of company. Uh, I don't know which one would have been more successful, but it would, I would have created a company also. Why different? What was it about HBS that you think made you choose a payment gateway? I don't think... I, I, I don't know, right? I don't know if it's going to be different or not. Hmm. But I know that basically, you know, my, my years at HPS was transformative. It did help me. Um, but I just don't know. I cannot compare it with something, a route that I did not take, right? Hmm. So, so that's actually something that's not so clear to me, hmm. right? Hmm. Uh, so, so, you know, a little bit more about my background. It's like my, my, you know, my family owns their, um, you know, they're in the business world also. Hmm. They're entrepreneurs. So basically, that's a, there's a, always a family pressure to, for me to start my own company also. Really? So that's always been To continue there. the legacy and be on, your, be on your own feet, like stand on your own feet as well. Yeah. So basically, that's why I would have created a company anyways, right? Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. So how did it help you? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, you're right. I think I would say that it's the people that you meet, that you, were, that you hang out with and actually build bonds with over time. But honestly, mine was pretty practical, right? I, I needed money. My company would have shut down if I didn't raise money. So probably the pivotal moment was winning that social enterprise competition. Or and then everybody knew who Aldi was after that. Well, then we, we <laughs> found investors, right? You know, we got Patrick to invest. Uh, we got from North Star. From North Star, yeah. we got Grameen, and we also had the founder of eBay, Omidia, mm -hmm. invest, and that gave me some breathing room. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't know if I would recommend starting a company while in business school because it involved, especially in a different time zone, because it involved a lot of like time that you had to spend. I think Ryu had the same experience. Oh, it's terrible. I would. <laughs> I would not recommend it. I would not it recommend all. it, right? <laughs> I, I would say that you should think yeah. about the idea and enjoy it, but yeah. I don't know if you should run it. But at that time, I had dependents, right? People, there was like employees. We have 30 or 40 employees at the time. Yeah. There was all these communities that depended on us for income. So for me, it was a responsibility that I, I had to uphold. And I, I think that it did help in that way. Um, it also got me access to uh, a bunch of people that I met through these events and these networks, right? So not just the people in your classmates, but alumni and also just other startups and investors that were hanging out uh, throughout the time period. And 
I think that it's nice to actually be surrounded by a bunch of people you can bounce ideas off. But mm. to be honest with you, today, if you were to start a company, given the amount of venture capital that already exists in the region, right, and the amount of mentorship networks with like Endeavor and uh, you know Sequoia and all these guys, I'm not sure if an MBA is as necessary as it was before. I think so too. And, and it always surprises me, people who are in, say, like very established uh, technology companies who are still considering an MBA and... And you know, I I, I I mentor a lot of you know young people who are very very talented in their school. But I always tell them, look, an MBA I think is a wonderful and great place uh, for s looking for n new ideas, getting inspired by your peers more than anything else, and also building friendships for life. Which I think for me was the most important part of business school. Uh, I built friendships for life. Um, uh, school period is like that for me, uh, I feel. Um, but if you're in tech, I feel like the two years opportunity cost of getting that much better at your craft within a technology firm is still of greater value on an objective basis. Now, having said that, being in Asia, I have to admit the pull or power of the brand of HBS was, was very, very powerful. It opened uh, a lot of doors. You yeah, know, I, I could, I could, I could go into a meeting with any C level uh, and 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 be credibly received. Um, at least at the opening of no, that discussion. Not now, really? Huh? Still, still now. I, I what no, you I mean in general? Well, I mean like, nowadays. It depends, right? But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, if your company is uh, worth of, you know, if you're a unicorn company, then yeah, you don't need the MBA. But I, I think that if you're just starting out, I do think that in Asia, in particular, the brand does matter, right? I, I think more in Asia. Yeah. More in Asia. Yeah, and for the wrong know. reasons. Yeah. For the wrong reasons. I, I don't know, man. I feel like people that, st uh, you know, keep on relying on the on, on that brand is most probably not doing the right things, you know. I think I, you should be more independent. I agree. But if you have it, milk it all you want, right, to get what, <laughs> what you want to achieve. And I think yeah. people do that. But I think a lot of young people are mistaking the desire for that brand with the actual impact it can have on your career in tech. I agree. This is this is the big mistake. They're they're uh, when I when I drill down and a lot of these young people who say oh, I want to go an MBA and I want to go to a top MBA program, the root cause of that desire very often comes out to a reflection that on paper I feel like I'm not good enough on paper. I need some bells and whistles. I need garnish. I need a what do you call it? I need badges of validation. So you know. Uh, tech is littered with a, all kinds of very successful, insecure people. Um, you know, uh, I, I was one of them, um, and I think that that it's 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 okay to have that, but you have to be honest about it. You have to be honest that that's what I want. I want the badge because if you go there lying to yourself, thinking that it's going to make me a much better tech entrepreneur, that's not true. That is not true. The best way to actually learn how to be an entrepreneur is by either jumping in or learning. Uh, in another technology company, yeah. specifically yeah. about tech startups. Let's talk about our journeys. Let's talk uh, next thing about like you know what what you did. Wait, can I add one more thing on this MBA? Sure, thing? sure. I think I actually think that we we skipped one thing, which I actually think that taking a, a two year vacation or sabbatical is actually not a bad reason. It's not. Like there's many times in your life, like okay, I, I've been, this is my third kind of tech startup, right? Kiva, I saw scale, and then Mapan, I saw scale, and then now. GoPay and Gojek is scaling. I feel like, yes, you do learn a lot more in those two years or those th two or three years in those uh, roles in those tech companies, but taking a two-year break is not necessarily something that is bad, right? Y you, you do need that in your life and being able to meet people from not just your region, but all over the world, it, it is useful. So yeah. I, I, don't, I wouldn't discount that, but if you were, your goal is to learn and actually how to build a company, I would say that joining a high growth company is probably the fastest and most effective way because you see all the problems, right? Even though you're not in the driving seat yet. Right. But it is. It's a very specific domain too. But I, I want to go to Ryu's point yeah, about how we all kind of got together and met. And, you know, halfway through, you know, the first year, you know, I could see you guys already well into starting, or you've already started your own company, LD. Ryu, you were just about to, but you had a really strong idea of what you wanted to build. And I was kind of, you know, I felt a little left behind, but I want to say that, you know, watching you guys in action truly inspired me to not want to fall behind one. So there was a slight competitive element to it. 
But at the same time, uh, when I did decide to go for it, you guys were also the guys that told me like, what the hell are you doing yes. working in these other companies? You know, Even though no one was funding you know, Gojek, you should do this full time because that's how you get funding for Gojek yeah. by doing something full time. You, you remember that, um, that, that, that drinks that we had in 2014? Uh, it, was, no, it was the early part of 2014. Yes. Yeah. It was at, where was that? Uh, in SABD. SABD, yeah, yeah. Beer yeah, Hall, Beer yeah, Hall. Yeah, 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 I remember beer that. Beer Hall. Yeah. And then it was us three, we were drinking. Um, and then uh, we we asked. Uh, I think I think I said uh, both of us said to you, Nadim. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I, I was really upset you, cause about cause, it because you were you were at Kartuku at the time. Yeah, yeah like Kartuku, I was working right. in another company that we also ended up yeah. acquiring. Yeah, and, uh, then, yeah. and then I think the what you said to us is like, well, would you fund me? And we said, yes, we'll fund you yeah. if you do go check full time. Full time. Yeah. <laughs> then you're like, no, 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 no. Would you fund me now? And then I'll go full time. I was like, what are you it's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. no, no, we, yeah. Cause look, we always believed in you, man. Like, I think like yeah, yeah. at that time we were just trying to push you, but I think at the time you were still unsure about making the jump. But, but, but thank God you didn't take in a lot of our advices, dude. Uh, like for example, I gave you advice that you know you you shouldn't um, you know have you should have a full time driver instead of you know outsourcing it. That's you know? right. I remember <laughs> See, I'm that. So, I'm so glad you didn't take that advice. You know? I feel like you Dim, know. your driver should be all full time. Yeah, salary. no, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I said that. Oh my god, yeah. But yeah, but I think that's for me like one memorable moment was actually when you helped me raise money that summer. Yes, I remember that. Two thousand. Two thousand and ten. 2010. The internship, right? He was looking for an internship, and I was. Yeah, just, I was your intern. So yes. For those of you who don't know, but you know, my my summer of internship where I actually started Gojek, I was interning at Aldi's uh, startup. Yeah, he was my best uh, performing alumni, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> no, but you 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 helped me, right? And that summer we we were pitching together, right? And we met a lot of people, and I think that's when you started uh, to look at motorcycles. And I remember you coming to the office and having these pictures of motorcycles and you guys in motorcycles and uniforms. Yeah. And saying, "Hey, how about this, right? Should I do this?" <laughs> which which is actually distracting me because that's not what you hired me as an intern to do, but. But, but we, the, yeah, you, helped, you did raise the money, so we did raise the money. We so did, that, yeah. we did, and so I fulfilled my my KPI <laughs> for the summer. And but, the best paying internship as well. But you know, you know, being in Ruma at the time, it was called Ruma. You know, what it impressed upon me is that hold on a second. So, the one realization I learned from you and from your organization was this moment of clarity when oh, actually, the bottom of the pyramid can be deeply productive a deeply productive sector. Yep. And they are also at the same time the most underlooked sector um, in, in Indonesia and I think in a lot of different countries. And that's what got me digging like, you know, you know, there was this Peter Thiel's book Zero to One and saying like, there's this term about um, all great companies began with a secret, right? And I always felt that the secret that we had in Gojek was the belief in the productivity of these of these drivers in the informal sector, and no one else believed that, mm -hmm. right? And so, working for Aldi, and you've been always a very charismatic person, and telling me how all these uh, uh, mothers in the villages and the rural parts of Indonesia were became the kind of the financial backbone of the entire economy. And that's what got me thinking. It's like, well, what about Ojex, right? What about Ojex? And so. I thought what was really unique about that was you guys were not just my, you know, kind of role models, my competition and my business partners. You were also my friends. Um, and, and that friendship, I think, is something that a lot of founding stories um, don't talk about as much. Right. Trusted friends that actually push you and tell you sometimes what you need to hear instead of what you'd like to hear. Um, and I just want to say thank you to you guys for, for always doing that and, and, and look at where we are now. Right? Yeah, thank you, man, as well. I mean, uh, I, remember when we had that office together in Chiasum? Yes. So yes. After you were upstairs. You were downstairs. No, no. We, no, I was upstairs. You were downstairs. Yes, we were right? downstairs first. And then I think, so we were looking, it was a, initially it was a kindergarten that we renovated. Yes. And it was very clear that I was very frugal or cheap. And you had decorated your office, you know, with like I think cheap is the right word. <laughs> I don't think frugal correctly <laughs> describes you. So I bought like a desk from a, a junior, from a. I, I felt so sorry for everyone that was working. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there, dude. It's yeah, terrible. it was horrible, it's dude. Terrible. I know, I know. It's like but, but listen gave, to your friends. No, I know, and you gave me feedback, and you're like, Aldi, like this place yeah. is shit. Right? Like <laughs> you gotta buy actual chairs. I bought uh, elementary school chairs because it was cheap on sale. 
And uh, yeah, so the, you know, little things like that actually mattered, right? So. Yeah, that was, that was really interesting. I, like, I, I know I said it subtly too. I was like, maybe you want to consider upgrading your office <laughs> furniture. You've got some really great talent there. I think they deserve to be a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, I mean, you have to remember that I came from a place where we were just struggling to meet and then we just had capital. So it was a, a mind shift. Right? Yeah, yeah, we were both the kind of the social enterprise people, right? Back yeah. the founders back in the day. But Ryu's office was always shiny. Oh my god. Ryu's office was like always like he was all about merchants and <laughs> B2B sales. It was Deca, it was like the similar of Sudirma. Yeah. Was, uh, we, we come, coming into Ryu's office is like, oh man, I picked the wrong sector. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the desk like I, yeah. have, I have standards, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's okay. Now I think you know, I think we learn. I think mean, like that's what you taught us Ryu as well. It's like okay, people need space, people need uh, yeah. quiet time. To be productive, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I got you to buy a Jabra. Yes, you know that's right. So, <laughs> it's it's incredible how different we are in terms of personality and and styles, and yet we're still able to collaborate. You know, for the most part, effectively, right? And still be you know the greatest of friends. But like you know, Ryu, your 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 impact to the organization and your impact to me personally. You know, if, if Aldi is the accelerator, like you are the brake, right? You are the brake. You are the person who says, wait a minute, you know, that's all fun and great. And we should, we can do that. But have you thought about the downsides, right? Yeah. So what's it like being an entrepreneur, um, leading the show and, and having that very strong risk averseness? Uh, has it, has it been a strength? Has it been a weakness at all? Has it? What's that like? I, I think I think uh, in the B two B space, I think it's a strength. Yeah. In the B two C space, I think it is a weakness, because I think um, in the consumer as well as businesses, they have different SLA standards. As a consumer company, if you make some mistake, you just say sorry, uh, give them some vouchers, and tomorrow they'll forget. Do, are you Are you trying to say something about Gojek? No, I'm talking is, about is this that, that is. <laughs> <laughs> These are things I. Are you, you giving know. me feedback right now? <laughs> Basically, as a as a B two B company, right? You 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 make a mistake, right? Yeah. Uh, you you go down uh, for some time, um, and you say sorry, and it's not enough, mm. right? They remember, right? Uh, you know, because it's their business. It impacts well. their business, right? Yeah. It impacts their uh, as a, as a business. If you're a B two B, you serve a business. You don't serve an individual. You serve a collective member of a team, right? You serve like, let's say 20 person team, you serve a hundred person team. Uh, you know, when you deal with like the largest e-commerce in, in Indonesia, you serve like a thousands of tens of thousands of people, right? That rely on you. So, so they don't forget. So in that sense, basically, um, because you have to have a high SLA standard, I think that risk averseness helps because it allows you to retain these businesses to continue to work with you. So. And was that a tough transition process when, you know, we all, we all, by the way, for the audience that doesn't know, we all ended up merging our companies yep. into a single one, right? So was that really difficult for you to come in into a very high risk uh, DNA of a company like Gojek? It was definitely difficult, right? Yeah. Um, I learned a lot. I learned that basically areas where I didn't have to take risks, I mean, I, where I was risk averse, then... I learned that I could take risks, right? Hmm. Uh, and, and I think that was some of the greatest things I, I think um, that I learned from going to, joining Gojek. But at the same time, I thought that, you know, sometimes you feel lonely because you're the only one saying, oh, you know, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, right? Let's, let's hold down when everyone else wants to kind of go and become a striker. Yeah. So you're the, like the lone defender in, in, in the soccer match because everyone else is a striker. Yeah, and everyone's moved up to score a goal. Exactly, <laughs> you're, you're the only one behind, right? And um, but it's okay. I think I think um, you know, like using that example as in the in the soccer soccer match, right, or a soccer team. Everyone, a defender has a role, right? A goalkeeper has a role, right? You as a, I feel that I'm some ways I'm the goalkeeper of the overall, um, you know, a merchant org in the sense that um, you know, I don't do much. Uh, people don't know what I'm doing, but I do contribute. Right. Wow. So. I think you're you're under underplaying the value of the entire merchant ecosystem, which is, in many ways, the future of the entire business. Yeah, you know, you're so. holding, <laughs> us, you're keeping us afloat, man. Yeah, it's like no joke. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that you know that this this thing about the lonely defender, I, I really love this analogy because at the same time it is lonely, and you're not alone though. There are other people who have natural inclination to 
uh, be calculative and to assess risks. Yes, not us. But you know, at our at our level, I think you're you're you are the bastion. You're the sweeper. Yes. If if anything, but you know the how then your role in our organization, especially with me, you become my go-to expert on all things like how can I be wrong on this? What could go wrong on this? Right? Which is a also a incredibly important, you know, position to be in and incredibly valuable part because you're right. Everyone's trying to strike a goal, especially Aldi over there. Just constantly trying to score <laughs> trying goals. To goal, right? yeah. <laughs> trying to score goals all the time. Aldi yeah. actually Aldi's actually a pretty good football player too. He used to s- score goals on me all the time in the HBS yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> soccer pitches. But I think I think you know in overall Gojeka, I you know, I have to agree with you in the sense that uh, there there are other defenders, other goalkeepers, right? I think Tom plays that role. Yeah, yeah. Shinto plays that role. Yeah. Nila, you know, plays that role. Yes. Right. We and should I, have all the defenders on the next podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be awesome. The defenders, right? Yes, uh, the, the, the people that are a little bit more paranoid, right? Uh, so so I you know, but 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 yes, I think we we have to become like the brakes uh, to uh, everything going on in Gojek. Uh, because you know we need to make sure that the platform and our company grows. Yes. Right? To yeah. grow, we need to defend. So Nadim was interesting, right? So he was the defender, but when you were trying to decide to move to Gojek, the defender was telling you to score. Yes. So that is like, true. like what, what, what made that decision difficult? Because when Ryu was saying it, for me, it was like, oh, even Ryu was telling him because to jump. Because Ryu is a do as I say, not as I do kind of guy. What do you right, mean? I mean, like that's why he was just telling me to go do it. But then, <laughs> 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 <He was> like, <laughs> you know, yeah. Again, what again, what, what compelled the... you? What compelled you to give me that advice, like to gun for it? I I thought that logistics. I mean, back then, you know, it, you know, the the where I saw Gojek was as a logistics play, right? Mm. And that's how I think you thought initially on how to make money. Yeah. Um, and then we had a lot of discussions on the logistics side. So, you know. Even back then, I mean, you know, logistics was there's tremendous opportunities, and I still see tremendous opportunities for logistics. So that's that's what I saw, right? Mm. Again, th- that's that's my weakness. I don't see the B two C play. Mm. I did not see go food. I did not see go ride. I saw the B two B go send. Mm. Mm. I actually saw the opposite, which is interesting because I was in the same building, and you weren't there because you were like working in another building, right? So I would go to the call center and I. And somebody would tell me all sorts of weird orders. Like somebody will bring their laptop or bring their dog food or or, or actually take them get grocery shopping. Things that because when you had a call center, you couldn't actually restrict what people ordered. Mm. Right. And when I saw that and I saw that we had this Ojek uh, corner near our office. Right. And the drivers were just constantly gone. And it, it annoyed me that I couldn't get them. Yeah. But at the same time, it was cool because you could see that it was picking up. And yeah. for me, I actually saw really, wow, this is a there is a real consumer pull for for this and the drivers are actually doing really well and are able to do more things than I ever imagined. So that was I thought was cool and being there. Yeah, that's interesting. So basically I think you know the power of the Gojek platform is that it could be super useful for B2B. It's like there's tremendous opportunities in the B2C. You know so basically it, it could be both. Yeah. And that's yeah. why we were this size and we've been this successful, right? Yeah. yeah, and I actually met those drivers yesterday, by the way, the GSM drivers. They were the ones in the convoy. They were. Yeah, yeah and yeah, I, yeah, the guy for... next to me was the guy that used to, like, be in this, you know, we would wait for the bathrooms together. I still remember it was. Yeah, Muliona's, like, like first driver. Yeah. Like, ever, which I recruited myself. <laughs> yeah, for those of you that don't know, we just did our rebrand. Yes. This is our new logo symbol called Solve, right? Kind of looks like a Gojek driver from top. It's also part yep. of a wheel. Um, pretty successful, but you're you're absolutely right. But how how did this change our? How did working together and merging our companies? I mean, we went through so many challenges trying to merge the companies together. There were cultural shocks. There were all kind of organizational issues that we all faced. Um, but how did it affect our relationship? How did you think it affected our friendship? I mean. Not much, Not right? Much, yeah. Because I mean, basically, when we got together, right? For example, me and Aldi, right? When we got we got together pretty often, right? Uh, yeah. Before, we, before. Yeah, because I think at the end of the day, it was really lonely as a founder. Yeah. And all we did when we got together was talk about work, but then it was as two separate companies. We sounded really boring. Ruma right? as a Mintrans, and we talked about how you know challenges we're challenges having. we're having, right? And today, basically, when we meet together casually, we talk about 
work. So. <laughs> 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 the team, man, in, in our discussions, I mean, when we got together, right, when we were at that beer hall and three of us in 2014, we talked about work. Work. Yeah. Right? So basically, it is our passion. Today, we talk about work. Yeah. Right. I mean, and the thing is, like, when, but, when you're. But does it change when we're all in the same boat now? I, I think the thing is, Gojek is big enough that you, everybody has their own different problems to solve. And it yeah. was kind of similar to when we had different companies, right? When you were solving a b- completely different problem with the drivers, we were solving completely different problems with online merchants, but we all had similar s- con- uh, problems with culture. Yeah. For example, like how do we recruit people? How do we recruit talent? We talked about how should we just start an academy for pro- engineers because it's really hard to find you know really great talent mm-hmm. at the price that we could afford at the time, right? Yeah. And we talked about how we could scale up. We talked about finding office buildings and issues with uh, you know potential. Uh, regulators and partners. So we had a lot of different problems that we are having today. Just We just have a different platform that we're in it together. So I thought that was... And I think the other thing that changed, may, maybe if you're talking about change, is that we are willing to help each other more. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. For example, you know, before, because it was separate organizations, the I, I would love to help out, right? But there was a limit to how much I could help out. Yeah. Right. Because there were three separate orgs, right? But now, right, as, as we are together as one, the willingness to help out is significantly more. Yeah. So I think we work as a team. I, and right? we, should, we should talk about how we dis, how the process of how this happened, right? Because that I think was a really interesting process of yeah. how we ended so up. We were talking separately, right? I was talking to you, and then I was talking to you separately, and then some way along the line, you guys started talking to each other and conspiring yeah. against me. That's uh, well, right. So yeah. yeah well, when, how, how did that who, happen? Who who you who you talk with first? Is it me or is it? I think Aldi? you first. Yeah, him first. Because yeah. you I remember guys this. were already working together. Yeah, yeah. I remember this. Yeah. And then, and then I think so uh, back tell us then. The story, Ryu. Back then, basically, I think you were thinking about growing pay. Yeah. And you approached me about basically running pay. Yeah. And then I had a lot of doubts because I knew pay was a B two C. Yes. You know, it's a payment method, yes. right? Yes. And you were B two B. I was B two B. I said, yeah. Dim, there's a better person out there. That could, that could potentially be the CEO. Of this That's thing. right. And then, and then you're like, you that put the idea yeah. of Aldi. No, no, no. You said that. Don't worry. In my head. Don't worry. No, what, what you said is like, I said, uh, Ryu, don't worry. I'm already thinking about something to do with Aldi. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's right. And then you came to me and started talking about this super app where everything together could be one in Indonesia. And I thought, okay, that's an interesting idea. And uh, you want? You I was just selling back then. I never thought it would actually become a reality. No, but you said this master actually said it, right? And, and uh, I was. Uh, I remember that you guys just got the license. And yeah. okay, just at the time, Ruma was already starting to get to get into financial services. That's right. Right. We actually had a license to do a branches banking pilot to actually help people get savings yeah. for the villages. So, ten cents a day gets your kid to college, right? And I remember. I think. One of the th- things, the first moment where it hit me was when we had that. So when we, when there's one of the ladies came to one of our gatherings for the savings, and she said she couldn't save anymore. And I thought about, and she said she wanted to be a Gojek driver. Yeah. And at the time, it was really hard for people to get in because there was such demand to become a driver. Yeah. And we were meeting at an event in Sahid Jaya Hotel for an MOE event. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. we made a video. And saying, "Hey, Miss Apia, welcome to Gojek. Congratulations." We let her, we let her into we the, let her Gojek, in the Gojek, Gojek, right? Oh yeah, so and she could compound her income. Exactly, that was amazing. And because she, I th- she didn't have, a, she had, she didn't have a husband or lost her husband at the time, and she didn't have any income, and she said that she could only make money by driving a motorbike. And oh, sorry, like November two thousand sixteen. Yeah, yeah, around there, right? Yeah, November two thousand sixteen. And then I think we, yeah. and then we decided because I saw what happened was she. Because Mapan was solving uh, an, uh, s- the other side of the problem, which is savings. Like, yes. how do you reduce spending, right? But I-, I didn't help so much with how do you earn income. Yeah. And all of the Ar- Arisan leaders in Mapan were all women. And so how do we help them earn income? And we we did a pilot in Jogja where the husbands were Gojek drivers and the wives were Arisan leaders, right? Yes. And I remember, because you didn't even go to that one. You sent Andre as usual to... Uh, <laughs> And then the, the, the household income the, just like blew up. Blew up. It right? was and 10x. They, they almost instantly joined the middle class. I remember that. That was that was the point where I realized like this is a powerful combination. And and I also remember I wanna I wanna say, you know, very honestly and openly that, you know, there was that moment where given all of our aspirations, 
we were having honest discussions with each other about where we might bump into each other in the future. You guys remember this, right? Yeah. There, there, were, there, there were open and honest discussions, and I think this is a really important thing um, among founder to founder relationships, like that openness and honesty about where our vision was and where we may clash and compete in the future led to the first discussions about, hey, what are we gonna do? We're all friends. We all have a very similar vision about empowering Indonesia through technology uh, and, and, and empowering the bottom of the pyramid yep. as well as small businesses. Um, w what are we doing? Should we go and grow our own and end up bumping into each other and competing with each other? Or should we just form an alliance uh, and 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 you know fight this battle against the old way of doing things together. Well, I think look, I, I like to caveat that there's nothing wrong with competition, right? Competition in you know, a certain level is healthy, right? But I think I think where we basically kind of agreed is that hey, look, if we cooperate together, we could achieve our goals, our respective goals, faster. Yeah. Right. It it was more about you know that that collaboration will make our. Uh, will will allow our constituents, whether it be the merchants, consumers, the drivers, achieve their goals faster right. as we work together as a team. Right. So I think that was I think the, the thing that made me excited about joining Gojek. Yeah, and honestly, it was just we all have at some point in our lives worked together, right? I worked with you on a tech conference. Yeah, Boost Asia, Boost 2012. 2012, right? That yeah. was the first tech conference in Indonesia, and so. Okay, I know I can work with this guy, and we mm. talked about starting. You, we work together, obviously, right? And so, I knew that we could work together, and I, yeah. we always trying to figure out a way to work together, but couldn't figure it out. And yeah. I think when you were able to raise a bunch of money, <laughs> <laughs> and you're grow, welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and grow, we had this opportunity. So, but to be honest with you, I don't think it was an easy decision. I think Ryu, kind of, as the most risk averse guy, held on for a long time. Yeah, and then you guys had a had a discussion. Tell me about that discussion. Yeah, so what, I remember. What was that I'll never forget this, right? So I was in I was in Bali. I was like trying to figure this out, taking a holiday. I was surfing, and I just got out of the water. And I think you called me, and we were talking about, hey, did you hear? I just got the offer to join together, and apparently you had the same offer. Yeah, I don't think I knew at the time. It was one of my first moments, and we had discussed this for a while, and then. At some point in the conversation, we were talking about, yeah, but it's like high risk, it's like really fast. It's like we were much more kind of conservative in, in raising money. And uh, at some point I said, I think I was me or you, you jump, I jump. You said that. I said that, right? You yeah. said that. I said, yeah. you jump, I jump. It was a titanic moment. Yeah, it was a titanic moment between the two of us. <laughs> wait, yeah. wait, who was, who was the, who, who said it to who? You said it to Aldi. No, no I think, uh, Ali said it to me. Ali yeah. said, "You jump, I jump." Yeah, yeah I, I think. So. Wow. Yeah, I, I think so. I think. Hey, Ryu, yeah. look, man, if we're gonna do this, because it was about payments, right? And yeah. We both actually came from different sides of payments. Yeah. Like Ryu really understood the the merchant side and how to make sure that businesses that are served are really taken care of, and I was about the consumer side. I've been doing the same kind of base of the payment financing for a while, and I, I I didn't think I could do it with with with. You know, without Ryu, so I thought, okay, if we're gonna do this, at least if we're gonna be able to convince Nadim, there needs to be two of us. And so I said, you jump, I jump. And yeah, that's so sweet, guys. Yeah, thank you, thank you for reinforcing each other. And honestly, you know, all jokes aside, um, <laughs> I don't think we would be here in any shape or form where Gojek is today without your organizations coming in and just taking over some of the most important chunks. Of, of the organization. I think we would have been still struggling today to find different, you know, both organizational capabilities and especially you guys as leaders to be able to, you know, stop me from making the dumbest mistakes I would have made. And, but. You think so, dude? Think I, I think that the Gojek platform is strong enough that it would have gotten to where it is today without us. But it was just taking a little bit longer. A lot longer. <laughs> a lot longer. And you know, that was, yeah. you know, that, that took a lot of thinking, you know, because at that time, I had by, f like by far the most number of, of high, high qualified engineers because I had the most funding, yep. right, at the time. And so, you know, I could have very easily had the hubris of thinking, oh, why don't I just build this myself, right? Why don't I build these capabilities? But, you know, that's where the trust and the friendship kicks in and understanding that, hold on a second, 
just because you can do it does it mean that you will be successful to do it and gojek at that time kept on get succeeding at doing things on its own so we could have very easily run into that pattern of like oh i'll just do everything myself but you know we kind of stopped ourselves and said hold on a second payments is a totally different ball game right merchants and payments is a totally different ball game this is a ball game where the the uh, margin of error is very very thin um, this is uh, where the regulatory structure and the thought process of rollout and MVP is completely different to your to ride hailing or food delivery um, and, and and when I began to realize that there was also this other element that came on um, which was at that stage you know uh, you know I had I had a couple of co-founders in Gojek but as you all know being a founder, in, in many ways, starting a company from zero is one of the most lonely jobs in the world. And I, and I don't exactly know why, but that cliche is very, very true. You get, you, get, you get really lonely because it seems like the buck always has to end with you. And so the ability to have two other superstar founders come on board and be able to spar and just get emotional support even not the sparring part, but just to be able to empathize and say, hey, I got you, man. I got your back. I know what you're feeling. It, it was massive for me. It was massive. I instantly felt that I wasn't alone when you guys came on board. And I felt like I was not, you know, uh, you know, even though I had an amazing team, but, you know, having other people who built something from scratch was really transformational for me. And a lot of people do not factor that in in the whole you know, startup and founding story enough. The amount of emotional support that you have through this is one of the highest variables that will lead to either success or failure, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys felt the same, but I, I felt like I felt like I wasn't alone anymore, and I could I could spar. I, I agree. Ri, what was your hardest moment before Gojek? Like, when did you feel you had just a really shitty year or month? Mm, September 17, 2016. What happened? I went down for 24 hours. Oh, I remember that. I remember. We, we immediately met after that, actually. Yeah. That was the worst day of my life. Yeah, that was very difficult. Even now, when you talk about it, it, I could see your face yeah, changing. Yeah, it just reminds me, you know. But And, and you know, I, I thought that I was going to go bankrupt. You know, as a gateway, as a payment gateway, you know, you you just cannot go down, right? You have to have high SLAs, and that's when I remembered that I think I was building new, too many new features. I was not focusing enough on reliability. Um, you know that 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 thing really changed the way I, th I looked. And um, I remember that day because um, the day after, you know, my, I was I was in at home and I was discussing with my dad, and I, I, it's, I, you know, as my as you know, my father is one of the biggest investor in Midtrans. And I said, Dad, I'm really, really sorry, but I might go down. And he was like, were you like, do you have money to pay your employee's salary this month? And I said, yes, I do. What about next month? I, I do. Thank you so much. I mean, it's because of your funding. I was, what? And then he said, what about the next one after that? And I said, I do. Dad, what's your point? You know? <laughs> and, he said, and, he, and he said very, uh, very correctly that, look, there's only two ways you could go bankrupt. You either run out of money or you stop trying hmm. so so as long as you have money and you have you don't stop trying you keep on going at it you would stay alive yeah but you were paranoid i think i remember when you were talking to me after that you were paranoid about how your partners would feel you were just talking about you know and you weren't sure whether you could ever earn their trust again but exactly so that, that, that's that was a, your concern right I that remember. was my concern that's and, that's and, why you know that's why basically, you know, uh, I thought I was going to go bankrupt. But what my dad said is that, is that essentially if you stop trying, they will not believe you anymore, right? So I think, uh, you know, I tried harder. And I tried harder when, when uh, you know, went on. So Yeah, and every one of us has to have those moments. Yeah, so I think, I, think I, I like your point about like having like other founders like, you know, mentor you or not. Because in my case, you know, uh, other, than, other than, you know, you and Aldi, uh, you know, my dad was a mentor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he's been through the 98 financial crisis. He's, he's been gone through a lot. So having that network of mentors, you know, that's gone through starting companies or not is highly valuable. It is. Right? Yeah. And I really, you know, it kind of, 
I get this question every time I go on on, on a speaking event and stuff. And young kids always ask me this question, like, "Who's your role model? Who's your role model?" And they're expecting, you know, answers like, like, you know, Elon Musk and stuff, of which I am a huge fan and stuff like that. But honestly, who are your mentors and role models? Like, it's really hard for someone to become a proper role model if they're not your actual mentor. And it's really hard for someone to be your mentor if you are not actually interacting with them uh, on a frequent enough basis with yep. which to capture those pearls of insight and wisdom. So I always say, and, and I, I, I'm, I suspect people think I'm being like just politically correct and trying to trying to give props to my team, but I consistently say that my mentors are my team members, and I really, really do mean that. And those are the people that I learn from the most. And I'm just being honest about that. Like, I, I don't think it's very helpful to have a mentor that you've never ever spoken to, <laughs> or or a role model that you've never spoken to. And so, you know, those interactions, hearing your crazy stories, and hearing your, um, you know stories of, 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 of crisis, you know, they helped me get through mine. For me, that day was doomsday uh, in, I think, around 2016 mm-hmm. um, was when, uh, you know, uh, we got shut down. Yeah, I remember. Gojek got shut down uh, by the Ministry of Transportation. Yes. Um, it made it illegal um at that time and it got overturned in 24 hours uh, by the president that was amazing that was, that amazing. was amazing but it was like the worst and, and, and best day of my life uh, all in 24 hours and i thought that's it it was gone i, I the, all and the, the, the thing that stuck to my head was not you know it wasn't it's was like oh my god i think at that time we had i don't know two hundred thousand drivers on the platform yeah. sometimes I'm not, I'm not exactly sure but i'm like what are they gonna do what are they gonna do? This is their job. This is their income. Like, oh my God! Like, what do we do? And 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 yeah. And so, so who who gave you that? You know, who gave you the advice? Like in my case, the twenty four hours, my worst twenty four hours. You know, I think my, my my dad gave me a lot of advice. Who was the one that gave you advice during that that worst twenty four hours of your life? Oh, we opened a war room in my house. I couldn't even go to the office. It was just like, I was I was too stressed. I had to be in my comfort zone. So I invited everyone into my house and we opened a war room. And then I just said, okay, everyone, let's find out what the solution could be. Call up everyone you think matters and find out what we should do right now. So everyone was just like taking calls and everyone was taking call, calling important people in government, our investors, et cetera, and asking everything. And then turns out nothing we did actually did anything. The president was the one that overturned it because Save Gojek became the highest trending topic, I think, on on Twitter. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was not just Twitter, Southeast Asia. I'm pretty sure it went like a little global because we were one of the biggest Twitter users in the world. Um, and, and, And serendipitously, just like that, we were recovered. Yeah. But... If you stop trying, like people tend to forget about that. Startups fail. I mean, we learned this in HBS, remember? Like two thirds of startups fail. Um, the reason is because of the founders decided to bail, right? And decided this is not working out. So stop trying, right? Stop, stop trying. trying yeah. yeah. I mean, stop I think trying. if you think it's about not, not about money, it's about stop trying. Stop yeah. trying. Even more so than money is to stop trying because yeah. if you keep trying, even money can be solved. Right. Yeah. Eventually. I think you guys had a more shorter downtime. For me, the hardest moment was 2013, mm. when uh, we were just doing a pilot for branchless banking, the savings product, where we were partnering with a bank to offer this educational savings. And it was working, right? Mm. We actually had tens of thousands of, of people saving up for mm. the first time in their life because they never had access to financial services before. Mm. They were saving up for their kids' education, for college, and I remember I was in the middle of a training where I had used all the money I had to get all my salespeople from all over to Bogor in Kabun Raya, Bogor, and to explain how we were gonna go nationwide. I just signed a Series B term sheet and we were about to scale nationwide and I got a phone call from the head office saying that I got a letter that because it was December and my license for a pilot ended in December. I just assumed because we were doing so well, we would get extended. Mm. We didn't. They said, hey, you got to close down and return all the 
savings my God. and uh, money. So my business model went from re- getting ready to scale nationwide to not having anything. Yeah, and I think That's you never crazy. gave up, dude. I mean, because the, the, you know, the crazy thing about Aldi is that every time I talk to him, like his business model or the way that he explains his business changes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, I never like, gave what? up. I think you had the most, the record for most number of pivots. I did, yeah. I did. Yeah. But, but you never gave up, Because right? I kept failing and I was like, oh my God, never I got shut up. down. Because I had yeah. one that was working and it was, just got shut down, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's when I got the, I spent like months, not, unlike you guys, I actually had to spend two or three months trying to figure out what to do. Thank God my yeah. investor was okay giving me time. And mm. he, he said, look, don't worry about it. You'll figure something out. So as I was returning these money to these women, they all asked me, hey, why aren't you, you know, what happened? Why did you stop this? But then one of the ladies actually gave me the idea to start the Arisan. She said that, you know, hey, you know, why don't you help us find goods? Because when we save money, we save it to buy something anyways. So why don't you help us save up to buy some goods using the rotating savings account? And yeah. that's ended up being the winning model. So from mm. this failure, after three months of just, just wandering around and feeling helpless, to be honest with you, trying to, but trying to figure out what to do next, I got the idea from one of our, our leaders. So she was my emotional support. She said that if you just keep trying and we did and that now pasti ada jalan pasti ada jalan pasti ada jalan well right well, well played <laughs> that's our new our new tagline from our rebranding yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i think that's why it resonates so well with pasti a lot of people jalan. within gojek right yeah because i think it's not only us that went through significant pains where we thought we we were going to give up or not but we never did but, I mean, yeah, just I mean, just so that the audience knows what what if in case you don't speak Indonesian, pasti ada jalan means there's always a way. There's always a way, and that's so, the tagline oh God, for that's the new. Perfect! Gojek. I didn't realize that. Yeah, the there's rebranding. A, there's, there's that is their tagline. tagline. It is our tagline. That's yeah. who we are. Yes. Yeah. And that's it. Wow! What an amazing place to stop the discussion. So, for those of you going through dark, dark times as a founder or part of a team, etc., you know, rest assured, there will always be a way. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for being on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so Hope much. Hope to have you guys here soon. Okay. All Bye. right. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.